And I call on uh, the next presentation uh, on the same uh, topic by Gary's uh, Herbert, Properties and Evolution of Surface Spots on Young Stellar Objects in IC5070, which is the Pelican Nebula. Fantastic, thank you very much. Where have I got that one? Great. Um, so, yes, my name is Karis. I am Dirk's PhD student, so I'm hopefully not going to cover the exact same uh, stuff, um, but he's given me a very nice introduction there. So I'm very specifically looking at surface spots. So as you say, there's an awful lot of data in Hoyts, um, but I'm worried about surface spots. So again, this is the picture that we've just seen, and that's because it's the same picture in every single talk like this, um, along with this one. So this is the stage where I'm sort of, I'm very interested in, um, and I'm looking for this sort of stage, which is called a classical T Towery. I am looking, assuming I can get on top, uh, see, get an angle in there, I'm able to look at that surface object. Not obviously as uh, an image, but I can see the brightness changes due to spots. There are two kinds of spots. There are cold spots, which are much like spots on the sun. They're a consequence of the magnetic field. They are Couple of thou they can be a thousand degrees colder, uh, can be quite long lived, lots of things about them. And then there are accretion based hotspots, which is as material funnels in from the inner disk, it hits the surface of the star and creates a hot shock. It's thousands of degrees brighter, uh, thousands of degrees hotter, and create, can create a lot, of, um, a lot of energy. Obviously, like outbursts by accretion events are sort of quite common and they're very short time scales, but I'm sort of looking for hot spots that have a bit more stability in them. The difference that we can see, we see light curves that change over a period of m less than a day to a couple of weeks. The difference that the two kinds of spots make is wavelength dependent. I have to look at these in multiple colors. Um, a hot spot will really create a lot of brightness in the, like in the short wavelengths, whereas a dimming because of a cold spot is much more in the red and infrared. Okay, so my region uh, is IC5070. This is, as we say, the Pelican Nebula. Um, unfortunately, that picture of it hasn't quite come out as nicely on the screen. That's a picture from the Beacon Observatory um, at the University of Kent. Its distance is 795 parsecs, which is well within that one kiloparsec range that Hoyes has. Most of the YSOs in, almost all of the YSOs in this region are less than three mega years. Um, as it's a, high, it's a high latitude target, it's available for most of the year, so we have a lot of data on it, but it's also a focus of an observing campaign. Um, in 2018, which I think we saw some of the results from in Dirk's talk. In 2018, we said to observers, look at this, look at this region, then look at it again and again, which meant we have some very high cadence data for this region. But we do have data going back since the project was created. Um, the project was established in 2014, but most of the data that I've got starts in 2016. That's when my light curves really get going. These are what my light curves look like. Eight and a half thousand objects in the field. Most of those are not variable. Most of those are not young stellar objects. Um, we probably, we're doing analysis now, trying to work out exactly how many YSOs. I think we've got somewhere in around 300 that we've identified. But for this, what we did for this pro paper, this is the 2021 20, paper, is we looked at all the objects in the region and identified periodic objects. We actually did a double blind study to um, identify how best to identify periodic objects. We've come out with four methods to identify periodic variables, which I am now using to apply to the, this region and other regions. From the initial study, which uses the 2018 campaign data, uh, we came out with 59 objects, 
Again, not all of those are YSOs. We think a couple of those are background giants, a couple of foreground contaminants. But we have object light curves for 59 objects that look like this. They are smooths in phase, um, 0.1 in phase, and it's calculated a running medium. All I really care about, I don't really care about the up and down, how smoothly it goes down. I care about the peak to peak amplitude, um, which is this amplitude here, from the top from the to the bottom. Because I'm looking at amplitudes across different filters. So this equation is a very, very sim it's long, but it's very simple. Because what I've done is I'm going to say that all of those amplitudes are caught. If that amplitude is caused by spots, then it, there is a spot on a surface. It's a simple model. We know it's simple. Uh, we've, we'll deal with the fact it's simple. But there is going to be a difference in light between the spotted surface and the unspotted surface. And that's going to cause an amplitude change, a brightness change. Now, I'm going to introduce, so I've a hat here, I'm going to introduce a little bit of notation because it gets, so a hat means our peak to peak amplitude. Our little lambda is the filter. Um, I assume, like, the filters in UBVRI, uh, we're doing this for broadband. Um, when I'm going to say there's a little set, because we use our filters strictly sequentially, we go from longest, uh, from shortest wavelength to longest. If I'm going to put uh, bracket B, I mean BVRI. I'll remind, but I uh, just want to mention that before I go speeding ahead and you, everyone gets very confused. Because I look for the amplitude set, amplitude brightness in sets of filters. What I did is using a uh, synthetic spectra, which is the Phoenix, we mainly use the Phoenix package. I modeled for a certain stellar temperature, different sizes and temperatures of spots. Uh, about a million spots per surface, te per stellar temperature actually. And then I stored the sets of amplitudes that would produce. The sets of, in VRNI, BVRI, what that would, what that would change. And then I'm able to compare that with ob our observations. The temperatures that we've gone for, we've gone 2,000 degrees is the lower limit of the Phoenix model. Most of the stellar temperatures are going to be around the 4,000 Kelvin mark, um, but 2,000 is the bottom, so that, that's that. Uh, 12,000 is ambitious for one of our spots, but you never know, could get fun. And obviously, uh, we've gone the F here, um, is our filling fraction. Sorry, this is the, f sorry, I didn't explain. This is the flux of the unspotted surface. We have the flux of the spot, uh, unspotted surface, spotted surface, and our F is a filling fraction. So i.e., we've taken away a portion of the flux of the star and replaced it with a portion of flux from a spot. Um, that F goes up to half the visible surface, because any more than that, and we've lost track of what spot and what star. So, we built these, uh, so made this set of a, mi of a million spots to compare with. Fantastic. I used just an RMS on all th VR and I, that's where our most abundant, our most abundant sets, um, we always have VR, at least VRI. Compared they uh, observed, and the models, and found the minimum RMS. Fantastic, I found my best spot. This is the single best spot that will fit my model, uh, fit the observations to the model. Can't just do that, as much as I would love to, because these contours track this RMS. And although this is, cl this is the best contour, it's the best fitting sets of spots, we also have, there are some hot spots uh, this, this dashed line marking the stellar, uh, stellar temperature. There are also some hot spots that could also be effect effective um, in explaining our amplitude changes. 
So we have to go and look and, and we have to consider our errors. So we're looking at sort of statistical errors in this way. All our observations come with photometric errors and we can't, and we have to consider that. So what we did is we changed our, we created sets of our model, of our modeled amplitudes, um, sorry, our observed amplitudes that varied within their error bars. So our V, R, and I amplitudes were all varied. This is what this color bar indicates. If it's at one, it means that V, R, and I were all varied as much as they possibly could. Whereas zero is, you know, they were, this is very close to the original value. We then did that 10,000 times. So 10,000 iterations that show where these spots are gonna fit. As you can see on this side, which is the same object as the previous slide, that the uh, cold spot that we initially fit is in that, it's in that, our median is in there. We use the median absolute deviation rather than the standard deviation because the two parameters are related. It's a much better representation of our data. However, there are objects where this uh, division is not so obvious. It can be more 50-50. And so we consider anything less than a 60% majority to be ambiguous. We don't consider that. It's still, we do publish that number um, and it's there to be examined, but we don't consider it as a spot we found. There we are. Um, we also consider that the possibility that we're not actually looking at a spot, but there could be a very close by disk warp. I mean, could be a disk warp, could be dust in the way, could be something else that's not quite spot behavior, but mimics spot behavior. Some AA tau, AA tau being the um, prototype, some AA tau type objects uh, are very obvious from their light curve and some are not. So we created sets of amplitudes or our mock observed amplitudes based on various dust models. Um, and now we and keep track of what we recovered in those cases. This is for achromatic extinction. And you can see that we've got spots. They've recovered spots with very, very low error bars right at the edges of parameter space. These would never be con uh, realistically thought of spots. Um, but we have to test. The RV um, 3.1 and 5 are a little bit more tricky as they recover hot spots, um, but we just have to keep an eye on our amplitudes and make sure that we're not mixing them up. We're aware of it. So from our original sample of our 2018 um, campaign, this is what we recovered. We had 31 objects, 31 YSOs. We had a range of cold spots, far more cold spots than hot spots. We found six hot spots and 21 cold. Our hot spots, as you can imagine, as we kind of expected, have a much smaller area, um, all less than 0.1, which is, if this is our stellar surface, the uh, dark blue circle is 0.1. So it's still quite a lot of the large amount of the stellar surface. Um, but these are sort of, you know, 0.01. We I kind of expected that I wasn't going to see any huge any huge hot spots or any really really bright hot spots because all of our amplitudes were sort of in the order of, you know, not 0.5. You know, I think our maximum was 0.8. Our cold spots cover a much wider range of the surface with um, so, uh, surface coverages and also um, also have the potential to be a lot colder. This is also sort of kind of expected, but it's very interesting to see that this is our um, distribution. We had, four, we had four that were removed. Two didn't make that 60% majority cut, so they were in the 50-50 regime. We have, no, we have no idea what they were doing, but they'll get, they'll get analyzed to death probably somewhere else. And we had two that we thought could be AA tau. Uh, one was very, very clearly mirroring that gray extinction, and the other one was a bit more ambiguous, but wasn't, we weren't confident enough to 
uh, keep it around. So that was where we've got up to. We published this. This is all out there in the world. Uh, we identified the spots and we went, great, here we are. We identified some spots five years ago. Great. Oh, we've said, oh, it's still more, sorry. <laughs> so um, we looked at this and we looked at, because all we're about is the spots are really interesting and they're great, but what they're really about is tracing that, is looking at that inner disk, looking at the rotation, looking at the features of the stars themselves. We have our two, uh, as we've talk, talked about, um, the, these colors are the same ones that uh, Dirk showed on the sort of rainbow plot. K minus W2 um, as a color that traces the inner disk. And the period of being less than 5.5 days indicates that, they're, that the star has been released from the disk that started to spin up. Now in here, We've got the majority of objects are in that less than 5.5 days. Um, and we're also seeing the hotspots in the less than 5.5 days, which is interesting because if hotspots are a result of accretion and that's been released from the inner disk, that's something that's a bit interesting. That's a bit, go a bit unusual. But it's one, of our, it's one of our open questions about the presence of hotspots. Yeah, so this is our distribution. Obviously, this is a very limited sample, and so our real aim is to get further and further in. So, as I started con concluding earlier, um, so we identified some spots in 2018. Now I'm looking at the evolution. I am now going to be looking at the, as much of the light curve as I can. So, as I say, my light curves really start getting going in 2016, and I've then chopped those light curves into six month slices, which I then take every three months. So it's six months worth of data every three months. So each point kind of overlaps. And we see how our amplitudes change over time. Um, I also do the period finding method within each slice, so they're treated independently. Um, I then have to collate all that information and identify a final period for the object, not accounting for anything funky going on with the period, which is sort of a source of great discussion. Um, and I identify, I've identified these sort of the amplitude changes over time, which is quite nice. You can see that there's certainly trends going on where there's an amplitude, we think you know, something's going on there, dims down, and then we have another event again. We found 32 objects with uh, our AV data, um, VRI, and so then what we need to do is fit spot properties to all of these sets of amplitudes. Now, you know when people say we've got new results and they mean, oh, we've got results that like just about gonna be published in a week. These are really new results. They haven't even got a nice color grading yet. So do forgive me. I will explain. We calculated the spot properties from these amplitude sets within, um, within, the, within each slice. So, our dotted line here is the stellar temperature, and we, never, we, we only calculate when we have a signal to noise above three in all the filters, because that was a source of major issue in the first round. Um, and also when the phase, all the filters are at least in phase. So they had, they were, if they were 90 degrees out from each other, then they're obviously not you know, being caused by the same thing. Something's gone weird. Thankfully, that's not really been a problem. Um, this blue line indicates sort of a standard deviation of the phase. As we can see, majority here has been cold spots. We can see that there's been these sort of pairs, which is kind of to be expected, seeing as it's every six months. The idea that we have a couple of, couple of hot spots popping up is quite interesting. These did make the 60% majority, so they are recovered. Um, so we're looking, it, we're very interested to see what's going on there. Um, yeah, it's very, it's just very interesting. Um, we also have a couple here that will probably get cut in the 2000s, which are kind of related to um, having a high, high error bar up here. Um, the next one is even newer in the fact that it's a surprise to my supervisor. <laughs> here we can see, this is much more a cold spot. It's a cold spot throughout its entire time. 
here, we see the amplitudes are increasing, which is mirrored because the, stellar, the spot temperature is kind of level the entire time, it's the, spot temp, it's the spot coverage that's increasing. It's then dipping down and increasing and going past. Whether that's the same spot, um, and the phase is relatively consistent, whether it's the same spot that's changing, getting bigger and then getting smaller again, or it's a spot that's got bigger, faded away and coming back, we don't know. We're gonna look at the statistics for all of these objects uh, that are still being run, um, treating these spots, seeing if we can work out their, how their lifetimes, how they, whether they seem to migrate, or you know, anyth anything we learn about them, and then we can compare them to the stellar properties. Yeah, so that's pretty good time. So we have, I think, so we have identified cold and hot spots. That's what we've been able to do that in 2018. We've identified some kind of stable hotspot, which is unusual and unexpected. Not unexpected, hmm. We have identified stable hotspots, which are unusual because hotspots are usually thought of as much shorter timescales. We have, feel free to ask questions about that. We ha I, you know, we've talked about this, we've talked about it at length, it's also in the paper, um, about why we think hotspots have exist, are present. And we can show, have shown some first results tracking our spot evol evolution. Obviously the next thing to talk about is for us is to do statistics. Because at the moment we have 30 spots. Uh, you know, 30, 30 objects, maybe like, and then some of those don't even make the cut. There's a lot of more data to work with. We also have many, many more Hoyes regions which have stars that have different properties. So we have a lot more statistics to do. It won't always be perfect. We're aware that we have to pick stellar temperatures. Uh, we have to make assumptions. But if we can get enough spots and enough stars, we can really start to get some interesting results out there. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dr. my supervisor, and funded. And thank you to all the uh, lovely Hoys observers who give me data. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keris, for this uh, nice presentation of uh, some uh, results uh, from the Hoyes uh, database. And uh, uh, the paper is open for discussion. Uh, please, uh, uh, questions or com comments? Your, the diagram that you showed of the spot temperature versus coverage, mm -hmm. uh, with I think with the observations, the green uh, the green crosses. Yeah, let's go. Um, it, it shows yes, this one. It shows a clear boundary uh, at the bottom and at the top in the sense that uh, if you have a large spot coverage, mm -hmm. then there is a limit to the temperature difference. Uh, there are no. There's nothing in the lower in in the lower right and uh, and in the upper right. Would that be physical uh, physical effect or would that be a selection effect on the observations? Great question. Uh, so first of first of all, this I believe is physical. Um, it's very very unlikely to see very large hot spots. Um, the amplitudes that we would see would be extremely high, um, and it's far more likely to get a much if we see amplitudes that would produce this region, um, well, the amplitudes that would be large enough are more, far more likely to recover very hot but small, hot but small spots rather than in this region. This, however, I'm very glad you asked this question because I jumped and put this plot in. Ignore the AB. This is, in order to test our recovery, with uh, just our visual red and infrared. We tested spots that were 10, plus or minus 10% and plus or minus 20% of the temperature. We modeled those spots, then forgot that set of amplitudes and tried to recover it. Here, the amplitudes are just too small and they get lost in, they get lost in the noise, they get lost in the errors. So we're never gonna be able to see um, these very sort of like, 
sub 0.05 in um, yeah with with a limited lower temperature. So that is a re that's probably a selection effect. Um, with higher with shorter wavelength filters, we get a little bit better, but we still sort of miss out that bit really. Yeah. Good. Any further question? If not, we thank the speaker and the three speakers of the whole session again. And <laughs>